Visionaries is proud to present our 23rd season on public television. A lawyer practices law. Practice? What does that mean? Is lawyering something you rehearse but never perform? Of course not. But the phrase practice law hints at something beyond performing a task or completing a job. It suggests striving for something absolute but ever-changing, a quest with no end. Maybe that is what justice is supposed to be, a journey not a destination. We are going to tell you a story that captures the very essence of what it means to practice law. Not to just win a case or earn a fee, but to reach one more mile marker in the pursuit of fair housing, climate justice, public transportation, and better educational opportunity for all. Of American people, the Ohlone. To the village of Nairobi To the restless souls of all my homies This is not a song, it's a ceremony For the people of East Palo Alto And please don't forget the East Cause we are a whole nother beast Not that big but it's alright Cause we got a lot of bite and we never hold back Not everything that shines in the streets of my city is broken glass We're stars with color and culture and a whole lot At of first, heart. the offices in San Francisco and Sacramento, California, appeared to be staffed by ardent policy experts wading into the minutiae of complex issues. But there is something more going on here than meets the eye. It's a different kind of lawyering, one focused on using the power of the law and the will of the people to create positive change. I think our approach to power recognizes that there is no such thing as power with legs moving around in the universe. It exists within people. And the ability of people to exercise that through their individual actions and their collective actions. Over time, as I grew to learn the limits of, of litigation and could see the potential of other kinds of advocacy, first policy work and then really the power of community-informed advocacy. Yeah, so I'm really lucky to be able to partner with community organizations that are dedicated to nurturing the leadership of young people. Um, first of all, young people get it. They're living this every day. They go into school five days a week. They understand what supports that they need and they're, that they're not receiving. And they also understand what good looks like. It's transformative for us as lawyers because we become more powerful and effective and inspired by being able to work hand in hand with community groups and we're more powerful than we could have been just by filing a lawsuit. Lawyers can't change everything on them by themselves. Um, there are many lawsuits that have resulted in great victories that were implemented well and have transformed our society and there are many others who were paper victories for major reform, for major structural change, you need to build political will. Facebook Project is a great example of the both community partnership and creative legal strategies that public advocates employs. My name is Giovanni Brown. I'm a preschool program coordinator, but I'm also an advocate for my city of East Palo Alto. East Palo Alto is a predominantly black and Latino community, and Everyone who came to these meetings had family members and friends who had already been forced out. Low-income people of color are systematically disempowered. They never have a seat at the table in serious decision-making, and if they do, their needs are sloughed off as less important. I got involved with this work because I was served an eviction notice, and I sought out the help through community legal services. My name is Salima Hankins, and I'm senior attorney at Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto. 
My name is Jennifer Martinez. I work for a statewide organization that works with communities to um, organize for social justice. It's called Pico California. In 2016, Facebook was going to expand its campus again. It had already done so once and it was going to do so again bringing in thousands of new employees. See, the way I see it is, they didn't create the affordable housing crisis, but we wanted to make sure that they understood the impact they were going to create on the people as they moved in. And sometimes when you're in a place of privilege, you don't get to see that view and understand that very well. To really win systemic change, long-term structural change, you need to harness the power of everybody. Well, the great thing about East Palo Alto is that there are a lot of good community organizations. Our organization, Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto, Youth United for Community Action, they do a lot of organizing with youth groups, El Comite, mostly monolingual Spanish-speaking tenants who live on the west side, and then Faith in Action. Bay Area, they're the largest community organizing group. And we had been partnering with a few of those community organizations around housing issues for several years already. So by the time that Facebook was moving next door, we were already having conversations about what to do about this displacement crisis. So there was a ton of work that the community did um, to very thoughtfully consider housing, displacement, jobs, workforce development, the whole range of things that were a crisis in their community before any conversation uh, with Facebook even started. We knew that we wanted to challenge the, um, this expansion, but we, um, we didn't have that expertise. So that's where um, public advocates came in. There was a required environmental process and uh, we worked in collaboration with the ACLU to really drive home the links between the lack of affordable housing, the crisis of displacement, and the huge expansion of jobs that would be coming to nearby Menlo Park and linked those social impacts to the environmental impacts that they would have. Public advocates had our back in a way of making sure that we were able to go to this negotiating table where there was a disequilibrium of power coming to the table. That there were legal reasons that Facebook needed to be thinking about housing and displacement issues um, certainly seemed to help bring them to the table in a serious way. Although Facebook practice in a, in a certain kind of way technology, they don't practice life in a way of affordable housing. They don't lend themselves to be experts in that way. They don't lend themselves and experts to be able to negotiate community benefits and things like this. And so at some point they understood that they needed to listen to what was being brought to the table. One of the real objectives that our clients in that um, set of conversations had was to make sure that if Facebook was going to be their neighbor for years and years and years to come, that they started to better understand um, who their neighbors were. At some point, we were able to actually hear each other in a way that was real. The leaders from East Palo Alto did an incredible job of starting with their stories from their lives, um, starting with how their community had changed, what their hopes for their community were, and I think that that really set the right tone. I was immediately impressed by how different the tone of the conversations were than in 2011. Um, I think everyone was taking these conversations extremely seriously. The community groups in East Palo Alto that we represented um, and Facebook entered into a partnership um, monetarily, the partnership was close to $20 million. About $18.5 million dedicated to affordable housing, a half million dollars dedicated to legal services for tenants who are at risk of losing their homes. And I think the other piece of the agreement that was really essential was a commitment both from Facebook and from the community groups to work very closely together. Immediately after our agreement was struck and, and papers were signed. There was an interest on the part of Facebook to continue a partnership with the community organizations that were involved in that agreement. And that sense of recognizing the need to partner with local organizations, not just by writing a check, many companies do that, but by being in ongoing dialogue and relationship with organizations and community members. We fought for our civil rights and we've fought for peace and justice. 
We fight to free our own minds and to liberate our spirits. And Laws can be tools to oppress people, but they can also be tools to liberate and provide more opportunity. And so I saw public advocates really doing that, participating in this whole cycle, not just being a lawyer in a courtroom enforcing the law, but actually thinking about and working in partnership with community about what kind of laws could really change the game, change the rules of the game. The local control funding formula is a vivid example. This is all about community partnerships, long-term, ongoing relationships with a wide array of organized groups. Californians, uh, by an overwhelming vote, uh, enacted Proposition 30, and that meant billions of dollars for our schools and the school kids and the teachers that are so important to our future. Local control funding formula, which became law in July of 2013 in California, um, is really the result of a multi-year effort that included organizing, it included litigation, and it included a lot of policy and budget work to try to create the conditions that would allow this change to happen, which included more equitable funding for schools based on student need. It had a central component that was around local decision making with the engagement of community, which mattered significantly to the community partners. You know, when public advocates first started doing this work, um, you know, more than 20 years ago on the advocacy front, um, we we weren't really seeing students and families going to Sacramento, packing State Board of Education meetings. I was struck by the absence of the voices of people of color and, and the actual consumers of public education in Sacramento. And now that's completely changed, right? More than 10 years invested in really understanding how the school funding system was not designed to serve our higher need kids. Um, we made people have a real investment in wanting to change that system and then being able to put that time in and then win a law um, that actually codifies family and student engagement and school climate as a priority for the state. Those are huge things that would never have been won if students and families were not raising their voice up in Sacramento. We got a lot of spirit and we got a lot of soul. We got a lot of pride and we got to let it show. Our demographic equals beautiful, humble people. And look at the Part of the theory of the new school funding system is to have more community engagement and open democracy. And so we and our partners were able to put that to the board themselves and say, you need to be a model for how local school boards should be engaging with the community. Uh, and they took that on and they accepted that. And to this day, uh, the board is much better able to hear community engagement. The community, they bring the moral authority and the threat of power at the ballot box. And the threat and the skills that we bring as lawyers are, are necessary. The threat that we might sue, the threat that we will sue and do. And so when both of those forces are working together in the room, they can have a major impact on power. So with the adoption of LCFF, hundreds of millions of dollars in additional funding came with it to increase total spending in public schools. And a significant portion of that go to schools that have higher concentrations of uh, low-income students, English language learners, and foster youth. So right now, if you're a student and you go to a school district, you bring with you a base grant. If you're a low-income student, foster youth, or an English learner, you bring additional funding with you to that school district. And that additional funding is intended to address your educational needs. That's how a school district like Oakland can benefit from the new reform. Oakland Seoul is the first standalone um, dual language middle school to open up in the Oakland Unified School District. The students that attend that district now bring with them additional funding and greater flexibility as to how to use that funding so long as it's principally directed to improve or expand services to that student population. Uh, we understand that we are working with a population of students that are mainly low-income students of color coming um, from Oakland and uh, we understand the you know systemic racism that permeates their lives whether it's through the media and television, radio, whether um, it's internalized depression that we see acted out um, in our community here. We are going to Oakland Seoul um, 
and it's a middle school just started mm -hmm. this year with sixth graders really amazing about it is they were second graders when they started dreaming and planning with their families mm. and educators to create the school my name is Alex Park and I'm a parent of a child here at Oakland Soul. What's different about this place starts from how we designed the school from the beginning. It was a group of parents, teachers, administrators, and kids were involved for three years in planning of this school. So the, the students themselves participated in envisioning the kind of school they wanted for themselves later in their educational career. Totally. They said what they wanted in terms of the after school program. They voted on it. They dreamed what they wanted the yard to look like, mm -hmm. advisory. Mm -hmm. They interviewed the teachers, the principal, everything. Oh, wonderful. The education here is not just book learning, but it's, it's also very relational. You know, being cross-cultural, learning different languages. They're also learning Arabic, not only Spanish and English, but learning Arabic. Yeah, I'm super happy with the education here. So to hear that students, to hear that their parents, who are usually not at the table, mm -hmm. are actually uh, envisioning and making decisions about how education happens here, I think it provides valuable lessons for all of us. They have a voice in, in how they want to learn and what they want to learn, and that's a key quality for a leader, is to be thinking critically and make decisions and move forward in that way. So. I think this school here represents what we're actually trying to create in other communities across California. And to do that, you need to be in touch with the people that are a part of that community. Being on site, being on the ground, being in the trenches with those who are creating this kind of community is really critical to what goes into our work. We can say that about the school context, we can also say that about housing and about transportation. The schools are really like this really special place where transformation can, can happen for, you know, that's um, where we, if we're really investing in our young people, that we're gonna have great leadership. Education is where we kind of break, you know, break the cycles, right? It's kind of where we, mm -hmm. a room for possibility. I feel like what we teach our young people is like, that's, that paves the way for the next generation of, of leaders, I think for me, you know, being undocumented, like I think education was something that like, was kind of like, they're like, oh, you can't do it, right? Like, or you're not supposed to because you're undocumented. They, they don't humanize us, right? They're like, oh, the poor people, you know, the poor young people. Yeah, that's sad. Y'all have a lot of like really good experiences, really good ideas like on how to fix the problem, right? I feel like young voices are very important because um, we are the ones that are going through school and we are the ones that are experiencing these things. When we create laws that center young people, you know, with them in mind, with them being, with them benefiting, with them being empowered, we actually do it for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Like, when you put the most marginalized voices at the center, you're basically making everything better for everyone, right? Like, that's, it's just that simple. Um, like, years ago, these two used to be students in Californians for Justice. They were saying the same things that our young people have been, are saying now, right? And in 2013, like, Mauro was in the fight for local control funding formula way before it was local control funding formula. And look what happened now. Like, we got local control funding formula. Our young people then fought for a voice for young people to be at the center. And things are getting better. It transformed the way that we think about society and what it means for, for, the, for government to serve everyone. We're very clear. We're not saving anybody. Uh, people are powerful themselves. They're already organizing. They're taking a hold of their communities and, and have been voicing for years what they want to see. We come in and help them achieve that. We bring extra leverage, perhaps. Uh, we bring the law, we bring policy to help people um, uh, really bring to life their own vision. We look for folks that are not only have great talent as advocates, whether they be lawyers or policy advocates, we're looking for people who have a real uh, personal connection to this work. That for them, this is personal. Um, it's not just a conceptual approach to justice or the well-being of others, but there is a real uh, relationship between their own lives and the neighbors and the communities that they're a part of. All the attorneys here, every person who works here is very intent to ensuring that in creating change that we are also 
uh, par walk in parallel with community partners, and that's very important. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I see how we struggle as parents, you know, to even want to find, you know, what is going to be the best opportunity for Kaya, and then for myself as an advocate, you know, that the opportunities that I want for Kaya, that's the opportunities that all our kids deserve. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a story of love between my mom and my dad. Um, my mom was, uh, she raised my older brother and myself as a single mom in Mexico. She was uh, struggling to uh, earn a degree in psychology in Guadalajara. And that's where she met my dad, who was also a psychology student, but in the United States. I wanted something more. My name is Hans Moore, and I'm a senior staff attorney with Public Advocates. Originally from Nicaragua, I was born in the 80s during the Civil War. Uh, there was a lot of turmoil, and we left the country. We were displaced. And ever since then, I felt like a person without a home. So I came when I was 10 years old, um, and I entered the fourth grade. Um, I struggled with English my first two years. The, my school was not designed for um, supporting the kind of work, the kind of education that I needed at the time. But I, I was lucky. My, my mother was a teacher by then. And she really advocated for me and supported me. Um, and I was able to make it through. Being a parent um, just brings my work into just even greater alignment with my values. Um, it gives me insight, particularly because my daughter just started kindergarten. It's my first time really being part of a school community since I graduated high school. So to be able to experience a school as a parent and really remind myself what a complex organization even just one public school is, let it go a system of 87 schools or, and then statewide, you know, more than a thousand school district. I, I see it my, my responsibility to ensure that others have that benefit, that it's not dependent on whether your parents are well off or are professionals, but it's dependent on the school being funded adequately so that there's counselors and teachers that can meet your needs. And I don't want, you know, something better for Kaya if that comes at the expense of other kids in Oakland because every kid has the same potential. I was eight years old when we arrived and I was able to see them build themselves back up from scratch. This was very apparent to us when my mom wouldn't come home until 10, 11 o'clock at night from two shifts or my dad was absent from work and, and, and you know, manual labor jobs. And seeing them physically being worn ragged was a very visceral reminder of this is a, a family struggle and the reason why the struggle exists was because schooling was the centerpiece of why everything was happening in schooling for my sister and I. Parenting is a full-time job. They're always up in the air. We try not to drop them, but sometimes they uh, uh, hit their heads. <laughs> Rather than relying on a few change makers, we can actually inspire tens of thousands of people to take action. That's much more powerful. When you invest in people taking action together, you're creating change agents that will last a lifetime. And you're investing in a way that democratizes social movements. We fought for our civil rights and we fought for peace and justice. We fight to free our own minds and to liberate our spirits and Black power led the way for some while Moses led the way. So now you see the power we all have to impact what happens next in our communities, in our nation, and in our world. For the Visionaries, I'm Sam Waterston.
Visionaries is brought to you through the generosity of Alex Rosenwald Fund, the Rick and Nancy Moskowitz Foundation, Winkler Family Foundation, St. Joseph's Indian School, the Ferry Family Charitable Foundation, the Episcopal Diocese of Western Massachusetts, Bill and Helen Close Charitable Fund B, Boston Private, Jonathan and Janie Kravitz, Lori A. Martin and Christopher Eisgruber, Mince Levin, Open Society Foundations, the San Francisco Foundation, Watchel Lipton Rosen and Katz, First Wayne Bank, American Savings Bank, Central Pacific Bank, and Bank of Hawaii, as well as Beth and Brian Levine, Daniel and Eric Mandelblatt, Kara and Scott Friedman, Serdna Foundation, Diane and Charles Smith, Elizabeth Moore, John H. Beisner, KLM Foundation, Pilgrims, the Biela Foundation, the California Endowment, Wayne and Debbie Maycomber, with additional support by the following.